I am not Brian Smith, but I am one of the three bald guys. If you don't know who the three bald guys are, stop by. I've got a sticker. I can show you who we are. Um, we hear a lot of talk uh, in, in conferences like this about the networking side of our wireless networks. And of course, the management of the RF portion of that is at least as important as the networking side. So the best way to do that, of course, is through the use of the proper antennas within your network. So what, what I'm here to talk about, and I am Rich Hummel, not Brian Smith, is a little bit about antennas. Now, there are a few different types of antennas out there, and one of them is a printed circuit board antenna. And little do people know that this is Robert Boardman's first attempt at a 3D printer. <laughs> Sorry, we just had to throw that in there for you. Uh, well, I kind of like that one. But so to get on with, with, the, with the printed circuit boards, there's all different kinds of layouts. We have to remember what is an antenna in its most rudimentary form. It's a piece of metal that's cut to a portion of a wavelength. Your typical antenna today is a quarter of a wavelength. And if you understand the physics behind that, What's a, and how wavelength and frequency are related, you know that the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So obviously when we talk about printed circuit board antennas, they're gonna be most applicable in high frequency type of applications. Some of the pros and cons, printed circuit board antennas are really good for power splitting, signal combining, band pass or band reject filters. All very important stuff when we're talking about broadcasting. Uh, you can come up with intricate antenna shapes because you're working in a small area and again, you're using an automated process rather than hard, discrete components. Um, the production is very simple and it's easy because it's an assembly, you know, it's, it's a production process that is easy to repeat. You also have consistent quality. Some of the cons are, of course, the material costs are going to be a little bit higher. You do have a little bit more circuit loss and gain can be reduced again because you're talking about a smaller restricted area. Again, as I mentioned earlier, because of the basic physics, the types of equations that we use to calculate antenna gain, it's most applicable for, for antennas over 2.4 gigahertz. The other type of antenna elements are discrete metal components. And I always love this picture because part of when you're putting together metal, sometimes it takes welding. And if you're not really careful, you end up with a situation like this. And man, you just got to say something, but you have to stop yourself. These are some pictures of different types of metal antenna elements. If you think about, or if I think about the first type of antennas I saw, they were radio antennas and they were these huge towers, which is nothing more than a metal pole that's connected to the transmit source, right? Well, how do we get that, you know, higher gains into smaller areas? Well, you take a wire and you coil it. Right now, there are some potential problems there with things like induction. Once you coil a wire, of course, you're going to induce current and do all kinds of things. But if you know that in advance, you can add that into your calculations and into your antenna development. Oh, let's go the right direction. Let's take a look at some of the pros and cons of a discrete metal antenna. Um, high performance radiation and of course lower cost because you're basically using non-metallic, non -metallic but easily available materials. The cons are the production is very complicated. In a lot of cases, it's done by hand. So obviously you're not gonna produce thousands of antennas using processes like that. Consistency can vary. And that's probably one of the, one of the uh, most negative aspects of it. And of course, you must use only non-magnetic materials because if you use magnetic materials, as you keep passing the current through it, you're gonna get more and more, larger and larger magnetic fields, which again is gonna complicate your RF environment, which we're trying to avoid. And as printed circuit boards, we're good for applications in uh, 2.4 gigahertz and above. Metal element ant antennas are for of course, lower frequency applications. Let's take a look inside. This is the most common type and the most basic, I think everybody's probably seen we, what we call a rubber duck. But a lot of people don't know what's inside of it. 
to give you an idea of what actually is behind the technology, what's inside that rubber case. And basically it's a coiled wire or a piece of metal, again, cut to that portion of the, of the wavelength. This is what uh, an omnidirectional antenna might look like with some discrete metal components. Um, here's patch antenna arrays, excuse me, on a printed circuit board. And if you don't know why a patch antenna is called a patch antenna, this picture actually gives you a really good explanation as to why. Because it would, the original patch antennas were actually small patches of metal that were put, mounted onto a ground plane and produced a more directional beam uh, when you're broadcasting. Here we're, we're looking at uh, Yagi antenna elements. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, that don't do a lot of point-to-point -point stuff, you may never have seen a Yagi antenna, but Yagi antennas are extremely directional. You can get very high gain, and if you're trying to make a connection between two points, they're a great, great antenna for that application. And then, of course, parabolic dish antennas are probably the most directional. That they're going to give you, the, the purpose of the, of the parabolic dish is to focus the beam as tightly as possible. Sector antennas, we don't use a lot of them in our business, but they're very popular in the cellular world, and this is what they look like on the inside. Real quick, I'm just going to go through some radome materials. Um, it, a lot of times you want to protect the elements. Of course, the most basic type of radome material is no radome material, or what's known as a naked antenna. Then we have UV stabilized uh, ABS or ASA. This is just a type of plastic, a polymer that's used. As, as we go along here, the materials are going to become more rigid, and the more rigid they become, the less flexible they are for our different applications. If we're building an antenna and we need to put a radome on it, we want to consider the environment that it's going in before we go ahead and, uh, and start production on it. But UV stabilized, some of the pros and cons, good weather resistance, which is obviously one of our goals, um, stable plas plasticity. Here we talk about made by injection molding. To me, that's always a pro and a con because injection molding is a very expensive process to go through once you're making the, just making the mold part of it. Um, <clears throat> and there's no, almost no impact on the electrical performance of the antenna. Cons are it's got a lower mechanical strength and the molds, as I said before, are expensive. But these are the applications for UV stabilized uh, radomes, small terminal antennas, panels, and omnis. Uh, UV stabilized PBC, PBC is a little more rigid. Um, again, really good weather resistance. It's a low production cost. Um, again, if, we, if you make a radome that has any significant impact on your electrical performance, it's probably time to look at another material or another radome, another design. Um, and fiberglass is really the most stable. So if you see large mast antennas that have some sort of cover over them, there's a really good chance that it's going to be fiberglass. It's easy to work with, has great weather resistance, extremely strong mechanical strength. Um, but the cons are, again, it's, it's a complicated production process because if you ever worked with fiberglass, it's kind of a two-step process, long production cycle, and it doesn't look very good. But if you really need to protect an antenna, it's the way to go. And that's really, that's it for me right now. If you have any questions, if you want to talk antennas, um, because we see that more and more direct antennas are being used in areas where omnis were always the standard. If you want to talk about that and how it can impact your network, just find me or one of the other two ball guys. Uh, Smitty and Jason are not here, but most of you know them. But I thank you for your time. The rest of the conference.